is Nightline on the VOCM CFCB Radio Network and Big Land Labrador's FM. The opinions expressed on this show are not necessarily those of this station. And now your host, Jonathan Richler. Good evening, everybody. Wow, what a day. What a night. I can't believe it. January 19th already, 2015. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us tonight. We have a very, I think we're going to have a very interesting show because today was, by all accounts, um, a day that could begin with the word flabbergasting. There was so much happening, I don't really know where to start. I really want to spend some time talking about the Viking fur, and, and just because that's such a great name, and the mink farm that they're trying to uh, set up. Uh, around the Argentia access rope. I don't know if I'm going to have time. I really don't. So we'll see. If you want to talk mink, you know what to do. We did invite Dan Crummel to call in. We will see if that happens. If not, hopefully tomorrow. Anyway, let's get on to the news of the day. By the way, we are joined in studio uh, tonight uh, with uh, Councillor Dave Lane. Uh, he's going to be joining us tonight and um, in the future as well on, on certain Mondays because we need to talk about all things municipal, and uh, there is a great deal to discuss. So uh, pretty soon, right, uh, maybe in about 10 minutes or so, we will get to uh, Councillor Lane. We'll talk about all things municipal and many other things. So we would love if you call in tonight about uh, uh, any questions or issues you happen to have. And, uh, folks, if you don't live in St. John's, that's okay because we're going to try and get some other municipal councillors to come and sit in or call in during these segments as well. And I'd love to hear from a counselor from Mount Pearl because they did launch a safety snowplow program today. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, counselor. But the uh, key message is um, tell your kids to get off the road when snowplows are coming. This is what I can uh, determine uh, was the main gist or the thrust of it. And, it's listen, safety is so paramount. While we are talking about the possibilities of putting helmets on us as we go through our day-to-day lives one should also not walk in the middle of the street. So we'll talk about that and many other things in the moments to come. But we do have to talk about what has been going on today. More importantly, what has been happening tonight. Are you aware that there was a poll? Some people are getting a phone call tonight. If you were one of them, call in. I'd love to speak with you about this, or you can tweet me at VOCM Nightline or email Nightline at VOCM.com. What am I talking about? MQO. This is a polling company, research company based out of Halifax, I believe. They are calling you right now, asking you a number of questions concerning particular politicians here uh, in our province. They're asking questions about Darren King, Steve Kent, Ross Wiseman, Judy Manning, and Keith Hutchings, as well as, of course, the Premier and the leader of the official opposition. Kathy Bennett, Tom Osborne, Paul Lane, Stelman Flynn, and Andrew Parsons. The questions are wondering, how effective do you think they are on a scale of 1 to 10? What's interesting is that the NDP apparently are not being mentioned whatsoever. I have not, of course, heard this poll because I'm sitting here. And frankly, I don't have a landline. I do everything by cell phone. I don't know if these research companies um, have the gumption or strategy or resources to reach you via cell phone. Don't know. But if you got a call from MQO tonight, would very much love to hear from you. You know what to do. Bill 42, the House of Assembly opened up today. This was all in everybody's face. And if anyone was listening into the session today, it seems that everyone was in each other's face during the session of the House of Assembly. A lot of questions directed towards the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, who, of course, is not sitting in the House of Assembly. And there seems to be a bit of uh, who said what said uh, concerning uh, MHA Jim Bennett. There's a statement that was released, issued uh, pretty recently, saying that he did participate in the lovely discussion question period about the reduction of cabinet ministers. Folks, if you haven't heard, there is issue uh, surrounding the Premier stating that all options are on the table with respect to who's going to get cut and at what time. Apparently, uh, several people in the gallery heard uh, Jim Bennett say that Judy Manning is under the table, uh, but this is uh, clarified in the statement by the member. At no point, however, did I suggest or say that a specific minister was, quote, under the table. And, quote, a question was asked by one of many of my opposition colleagues of the Premier, is Judy Manning's position on the table, too? This was specifically in relation to her role as Minister of Cabinet. Got very um, churlish in there today, and some might say puerile, with the back and forth and lots of heckling being conducted by the official opposition. Many things were heard. Was this accurate? I don't know, although I can tell you many people on Twitter are saying, yes, I heard it, and many others are saying, no, by didn't happen. I can tell you one thing. No member of, of the government's uh, communication staff 
has uh, confirmed or has publicly tweeted that that statement was said. So that tells me volumes. This could just be a case of wonderful echoes within the House of Assembly. I don't know. Speaking of echoes, both the Liberals and the NDP are uh, not ruling out a filibuster uh, to prevent the passing of Bill 42. A couple things I want to talk about. Concerning Bill 42, you know where I stand on the reduction of seats in the House of Assembly. I've come out and said, I don't care how many it is, if it's 8, 10, or 12. If it leads to a more effective House of Assembly, that's the name of the game. There are many arguments on both sides of this issue. I think streamlining government in any way is a good idea. I don't think that government can get this done within the mandated time frame uh, that was in the original act to amend the, uh, sorry, the, the Electoral Boundaries Act, nor is it within the act itself that they're trying to amend right now. They are saying for the purpose of the appointment of a commission in 2015, I'm reading from the amendment, uh, the proposed amendment, they are saying that the Speaker of the House of Assembly shall appoint the members of the commission not more than five days after the appointment of the chairperson. Okay, so you appoint a chairperson to figure out which of the four people in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador will get the most feared and, um, I guess, um, unfun job of redrawing the electoral boundaries for the province for the next ten years. Let me ask you a question. How much would you accept as a salary to do this job? Because you'll probably will not get elected within any political sphere uh, for the next 10 years after you do so. So I'm going to venture a guess that the pay for to be one of these commissioners will be have to will have to be quite high or we're looking at retired individuals, those who are immune. Do you think it's going to be a short process to try and find four people who will accept this job? Apparently the current government thinks that it's going to be 5 days or less after they appoint the commissioner. That tells me that they are either putting too much sugar on their cornflakes in the morning or they have people in mind already that they're going to suggest to the commissioner. I don't know if it is possible to find four people who would take this job, first of all, and second of all, within such a short time frame. I just don't know. Second, this is interesting. The commission is going to determine a quotient for each proposed district by dividing the total population of our province by the number 37, because there's going to be 38 seats in the House. That uh, equals out to about 13,500 people, folks. The amendment also points out that uh, for the purpose of this mathematics, they're going to be using the most recent census data. And as I mentioned on Thursday night, that's five years old. So we're going to be doing our mathematical calculations minus Labrador, because that's also in this amendment, uh, and then dividing by 37. So roughly our new members of the House of Assembly, if this uh, goes through, will be representing 13,500 of us each. What do you think? You want to talk about that tonight? We've been talking about that for the past five days, whether it's letters to the editor, call, commenting online, or just calling us. And uh, I'm more than welcome any call about those issues tonight. Here's what's interesting, though. Both uh, the Liberals and the NDP are opposing it. Why is that interesting? Because the Liberals were for this a few days ago. Now, all of a sudden, they are not. So this is interesting. They're asking uh, that the Boundary Commission legislation be amended to state uh, if the Commission's work is not completed in 120 days, then the existing electoral boundaries will apply for the 2015 general election. That, I think, is the most interesting point out of Dwight Ball's office today. Fascinating. Because when you think about it, you appoint the commissioners. So first of all, this bill has to be debated for mm, probably roughly two weeks before it uh, passes. Then they choose a commissioner, probably another week. We're already into early February. Then they have five days uh, to find the other four cowboys to, to do this. That puts us in mid-February, I am guessing. And then they have 120 days from there, March, April, May, June is uh, the time frame before we even see the possibility of the redrawn electoral boundaries. Therefore, general election, sometime when the leaves are falling off the trees, I would imagine we're looking at October and possibly even November. Are we willing to wait that long? I don't know. I want to talk about CETA as well. Before we go to our counselor, Dave Lane, who is waiting patiently to discuss a few municipal issues, I want to touch on CETA. Folks, the show is going to be an interesting one. Darren King and Keith Hutchings have said this morning that our province has suspended negotiations with Canada involving all other bilateral trade agreements because of, well, essentially not getting anywhere with uh, Ottawa with respect to CETA. So as we know, they met with a number of uh, embassy representatives uh, in Ottawa, and they also represented, uh, they met with a number of representatives from other unions, including the Canadian Agri-Food Trade Alliance, uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Canadian Council of Chief Executives, and Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Why would they do this? 
possibly because they were threatening a pullout. And that's exactly what is happening. So we, this uh, province, will no longer uh, be involved in any way with uh, bilateral trade agreements. Here it is. The Honorable Darren King, I've advised, I'm quoting the Federal Minister of International Trade, that Newfoundland and Labrador is suspending its participation in all trade agreements and all agreements currently under negotiation. All right? So, we're telling Ottawa we're, we're not interested in any business. We're about to hit the biggest recession, I think, in two decades, maybe even three. Is this what we actually want to do? Do we have money in the bank to be able to call this bluff? You want to weigh in on this? You know what to do. Drop us a line. I don't think this is a very good time for us to be drawing a line in the sand when we have a very small amount of sand on our beaches. I don't think that this is a, a, an interesting way to go about it. What do you think, folks? This is your time. Give us a call. Anyway, right now, there's a lot more to talk about, but I want to welcome to the studio our very special guest, Councillor Dave Lane. How are you tonight, sir? Hey, Jonathan. Not so bad. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. As you can tell uh, by my throbbing vein in my forehead, there's a lot that is raising my blood pressure tonight, but hopefully and definitely... Snow clearing is not one of them. We had the most lousiest winter, I think, in the history of the universe. Last uh, November it started, and we're yep. certainly not seeing anything uh, to that effect. By the way, folks, Councillor Lane uh, is co-chair on several committees within the city of St. John's, including Economic Development, Tourism, and Public Engagement, uh, the Heritage Advisory Committee, the Environmental Advisory Committee, and, of course, Engage St. John's Task Force, Task Force as well. So if you have any questions concerning any of those, and any other uh, issues to bring to light, whether you are from this particular municipality or any others, tonight's your night to uh, to get it going. So, Councillor Lane, tell us a little bit about um, how effective your snow clearing plan has been, or the city snow clearing plan, because uh, I'm amazed. Sometimes, I think it was Sunday night or Saturday night at 2 in the morning, I heard some snow plows going around. Not only then, but the, the much cuter uh, tracks of a, uh, a sidewalk clearer. It's just fascinating, the difference between last year and this. Yeah, you know, it really is, and I've personally been really impressed and really pleased by it. I mean, driving around, but also walking around to see this. I'm a walker myself. Now, I live downtown, and I work downtown. Um, but also just driving to the east end or driving to maybe the central areas of the city, mm -hmm. you can see a very distinct difference this year from last year. Now, last year was exceptional in terms of snow, but I can I think we can all agree that even when a sidewalk was cleared, it paled in comparison to what they're at this year. So, you know, I'm really happy. Now, what happened basically was that we had such a tough time as residents mm -hmm. <clears throat> that we kind of kicked up a fuss, you know, uh, and we were very frustrated. I mean, we knew there was something that could be done better here. And it really what the city did, much to my uh, satisfaction, was to say, okay, let's see how we can do this better. Uh, we didn't we didn't push back so much uh, as maybe sometimes happens uh and we brought in an expert consultant, and we said, what can we do specifically? You know, we know that we could probably add more money or add more trucks, but we want some specifics. And so they gave us a, a series of uh, recommendations right down to how to schedule, how to uh, purchase. And uh, we've started. We haven't fa finalized entirely this recommendation because it's huge. But we identified before this winter started some quick hits, and we've been implementing them. And the big one, and the top priority, was sidewalks. How many hits are on that list? A lot. Uh, really, I mean, I guess I'll just ballpark it around, uh, I'll just say 15 for okay. this year. Now, there's there's things that happen uh, alongside of those quick hits. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're talking, we, we've invested more money. Uh, I think it was the tune of $1.6 million. Uh, and we've also looked at um, basically how we store some of our trucks so that they're not, we don't lose uh, the maintenance uh, aspect of that over over the cold temperatures. Okay. So we're storing them a bit differently and making sure that we streamline some of the systems that we use. When something gets broken, we can we can stay in close contact between the fleet and uh, central office. Those sort of things uh, that we knew we could do right away. But you know, I, I guess one of the major ones that I'm very pleased with. I'm actually the council rep on the downtown business. Uh, it's downtown St. John's with the businesses of the downtown. Sure. And what the city has done is actually taken over the sidewalk contract that uh, downtown was supporting. They took it over completely and basically tripled the budget on it. And they're responding more rapidly based on new standards for the entire city. Whereas we would probably respond to and and remove snow or start clearing snow when it accumulated to 10 centimeters. We're talking about five centimeters, and we're doing salting now. So. You're increasing the amount uh, of time and, sorry, number of times that we actually 
tackle the snow downtown. Now, why is that a big deal? I mean, you could say lots of businesses need snow clearing, and they get it. The point is, though, that downtown is unique in a certain way. One thing is that the streets are very small, mm-hmm. they're very narrow. Lots and lots of pedestrians all in one area, a crammed little area, because it's not just retail. It's also offices. It's also restaurants. It's our entertainment district. It's a safety concern. And it's residential. And it's residential. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a very dense area. Uh, and so that's, it sometimes feels like maybe they get a bit of special attention, but honestly, they haven't really been getting the attention they need. And I think that was a recognition the city made this year. And, uh, you know, I'm really pleased, you know, and the mayor was on board with that too. So we, I was the connection point between that association. Okay. And it's also, of course, tricky because as you, listen, if the sidewalks and the, the areas are being used so frequently, therefore, I would imagine the time uh, available to clean and clear these sidewalks would be the trickiest maneuver whatsoever, and maybe that's why I'm hearing the uh, the little tractors going around at uh, 12 or 2 in the morning as opposed to 9, p- 9 a.m.? Well, that's an interesting point. One, one of the reasons the sidewalks look so great this year is that we've actually created eight positions, eight more positions, dedicated to daytime sidewalk clearing. Okay. So it does happen at night, but now we actually have a dedicated team who can actually say, you know what, we're focused on sidewalk clearing and they're good at it. And that's why, that's the major improvement we've made. And I, I gotta tell you, I mean, the response that we've gotten, uh, just personally, but I think all council has received you know, accolades in a way, because now all of a sudden you have people who can get out of their house in the winter that maybe could not have. I've seen, uh, you know, a father walking his son and dog at like 9 p.m. at night down Logie Bay Road. And you know they're they're safe. Um, I've seen people walking to and from the grocery store, which you just couldn't do before. They had to be in the middle of the road, and now they have a wide, level sidewalk to to traverse. So you know this is actually a quality of life issue. It's a welcoming issue if we're trying to you know say people yes. Winter is bad here, but we're going to make it as easy as possible. That's a big thing. So I just think it's a it's a huge step uh, that the city's made here, and, and I think it's something we can all be proud of. I think so, too. Uh, Trent uh, Brinson, I'm not sure where you live, Trent. Maybe you can tweet that to me. Uh, we got to go to the break, but here's a quick one for you. Uh, Dave, ask Mr. Lane about the quality of street salting. My street yesterday was like a skating rink. So, Trent, I'm assuming you don't live next to Bannerman. That was a joke. Uh, but uh, maybe if you could tweet us to where you live, we'll get to that. Uh, we'll address that uh, directly right after the break. So, folks, we are taking your calls. There are a few ones here. Terry Hussey says to us, don't forget Dave Lane's official title is the man. Thank you, Terry. I'm confused. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> I thought I was the man. Stay with you. Give me the call. Welcome back to the show. This is Jonathan Richler, the host of VOCM Nightline. We have Lucas Wall, the Monday night producer. Oh, yeah. And we have Councillor Dave Lane joining us from the city of St. John's. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, Councillor. Much appreciated. Great to be here. Excellent. Excellent. It certainly is. Lots of uh, uh, interesting people that we will be speaking with. Uh, and, of course, we have one right now, uh, Ms. Heather Ballard, who I've spoken with. Uh, when she was representing another organization. But now, Heather, welcome to the show. You are part of a new um, organization, which I think is for a fundraiser called Voice for the Voiceless. So welcome back to the show, Heather. How are you doing? Oh, good, thank you. Good. Yeah. Tell, um, us, tell us about uh, what Voice for the Voiceless is, please, and thank you. Okay, Voices for the Voiceless is a group um, that was created, I guess, after all of, um, I guess, concern with the animals that hit the media in the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is, I think there's about eight of us on the executive. So what we're doing now is planning a rally, and it's going to be tomorrow. Tomorrow, um, actually, at the CBS Town Hall at 6.30. Okay. Um, and so that, basically the point of that rally is just to bring awareness to the town of CBS, because it did happen there, and also to, you know, other municipalities, not just CBS, because, you know, animal abuse and neglect is happening everywhere, and, you know, the laws aren't getting enforced everywhere, and they really need to be. When we are looking at, uh, this is something I was discussing with uh, Councillor Lane uh, right before uh, we were speaking with you, Heather. We're, we're entering, I think, one of the larger economic crises of, well, I guess it's the first one probably of the of this century. And this province is impacted on such a level. We're seeing members of the House of Assembly being cut even before the civil service. And we all know that's right around the corner. This is the time, unfortunately, where animals uh, will suffer the most, and this is why I think your initiative is is a wonderful and honorable one because it's just like there are certain forms of cancer which um, have to rely on private fundraising uh, to to get uh, awareness and research uh, dollars put towards it. This is going to be a time, I would think, when municipalities will will have to cut back on uh, issues around, I would think, humane services. How how challenging do you think uh, the next uh, six to twelve months are going to be for organizations like yours? 
Uh, well, I think if they cut back, it's going to be hard because I know the question was issued whether or not, you know, CBS alone has enough uh, municipal enforcement officers to actually do the job and, and you know, investigate all the complaint calls. But so they have five right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that question was brought up. I'm not sure how many is in the city of St. John's. I tried to find out and I couldn't. I don't know if you found that out. What I found out, Heather, was the, that there's probably less in St. John's than there are in CBS. Uh, I did not get an official number, but uh, I was, somebody promised to get back to me on this. But uh, that shocked me, frankly. No, I'm not yeah, sure if it's, was... if it's true yet or not. But, Councillor Lane, do you have? You, I know this is not your uh, field of expertise, uh, mm-hmm. the Humane Services. That's generally the, the Deputy Mayor, Ron Ellsworth. I'm not sure if he's available tonight, but maybe you can touch on this uh, briefly. Or, do you have any insight? I know that we do a lot of work with our Humane Services at the city. Mm-hmm. Um, staffing is often an issue because you can only help so many animals with a certain number of people. I think we have two uh, plus plus one. Um, but one of the things that we are looking at is uh, in the case of, say, an emergency, uh, if someone has to leave their home and they have to be put in an emergency shelter or, or, you know, there's something going on at the home, it's a broken home, a lot of the cases, the shelters for people don't accept animals. So we're actually looking into a place uh, so beyond the side of, of something that's already being taken care of by other organizations, and the city would be there to take care of the pet in the meantime to make sure that they're not left to maybe an abusive relationship or, or something like that. Okay. But I think it's something that municipalities do have to keep an eye on because it's so close to home. Yes, indeed it is. Heather, uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, th- that you are going to be up against, uh, once again, I'm going I'm to ask that because we, you say it's staffing in and of itself, but are you going to try and uh, work uh, against uh, the decision that uh, seems to be happening and that uh, RNC are not interested in uh, any enforcers outside of their own? Uh, I didn't realize that. Actually, that's the first time I heard that. Um no, I mean, you know, I, I do think that the charity groups and the rescue groups, I do think we will try and advocate for us to be, I guess, to have the authority to seize the animals. I mean, if the municipalities can't do it because they don't have the staff, why not work with the rescue groups? Well, a lot of us have done a lot a lot of work um, with animals and with different families, you know, from adoptions to you know, going out on complaint calls and checking things out. So, you know, we certainly have the knowledge base to be able to help. Yeah, some would say. And, and you and I have talked about this before. Part of the issue with uh, sometimes not issuing tickets or uh, seizing animals uh, on first visit is that the RNC officers aren't necessarily properly trained as to how to assess the situation. So your uh, level of expertise would come in uh, uh, much handier, I think, than, than anyone else's. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I did learn that the new cadets that are coming out now for the RNC, they are being trained somewhat more than the officers that are already out. And like I said before to you, I mean, they do have the regulations and stuff, and it's just they don't, they're not sat down, I guess, and they don't, you know, take the time to actually learn it because they really don't have the time to learn it with everything else they have to deal with in their job. Fair enough. Tell me uh, or tell us a little bit about uh, what we can expect tomorrow at the rally at the CBS Town Hall. Well, tomorrow is going to be very uh, peaceful, we're hoping. I mean, we don't intend to do any harm or, or cause any trouble for anyone. We just want to do a peaceful rally and, uh, you know, raise awareness of, of the issues of uh, animal neglect and animal abuse and that, you know, the laws need to be enforced and it needs to be taken seriously because, you know, it's the 21st century and animals do matter. It's not like years ago when, you know, dogs were tied out and left and that was fine. You fed them and that was that was taking care of them at that point. You know, so now... Um, we are also going to eventually, I guess, try and push for no tethering laws and other things like that to be added to our regulations. But for now, for tomorrow, we're just going to do uh, a peaceful protest. It's in memory of one of our dogs. Actually, he just died the other day. Oh, sorry um, to hear that. He, he was perhaps, uh, I think, the worst case that, that I've seen. He was absolutely terrible. When I see him, he looked like death on legs. And so we dedicated the rally to him because, you know, it's for animals like him that we need to stand up for and, you know, make a difference and make sure that they have good living conditions. Excellent. Now, you, you have a Twitter account set up. Uh, not too many followers yet, but I expect this will be, uh, this will grow exponentially. Voice for the Voiceless, you have it at VFTVNL. That stands for Voice for the Voiceless Newfoundland Labrador. Tell me, Heather, does that mean that there are other organizations with the same name? Or is this just a, a new branch of a larger organization? Organization? Pardon my ignorance. Uh, there are other organizations, I think, across the world that may have that name, but it's not doing what we're doing. Okay. Where that's just this is just a ranch for animals that you know that we created. 
Understood. Yeah. Heather, if anybody wants to get in touch with you that does not have Twitter, and that's, you know, lots, um, how can they do so? Well, we do have a Facebook page. So I uh, certainly, you know, get on Facebook, uh, Voices for the Voiceless. That's our page, and the event is on there. Okay. So uh, any questions or anything, there's always someone on there. You know, we can answer any questions. But it is 6.30. Let's repeat that. 6.30 tomorrow evening at the Town Hall in CBS. Uh, it's on the main road for anyone that's uh, interested in coming. We do have 500 people signed up, a little over 500 people signed up to come. So it should be a good turnout, and, and like I say, you know, we welcome everyone to come, but we don't want any trouble, and uh, it's just meant to be, uh, you know, a peaceful demonstration, so hopefully that's the way it's going to end up. And the mayor, you know, he's going to come out and speak. I spoke to him, so he's going to come out and, and speak to us. So I think that's good. I will uh, look forward to hearing from you, I guess, later in the week, just to let us know how it went, Heather. Uh, good luck, and uh, maybe we can get uh, Deputy Mayor Ellsworth on the phone to discuss enforcement issues, uh, because we, while well, we have heard from the from the town of CBS, and that is where the rally is being held, I think that, uh, you know, there are issues that each municipality faces with uh, humane services that uh, we should look at in, in greater detail. So until then, good luck tomorrow, and uh, I hope that everything is and remains peaceful. Peaceful. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye. So once again on Twitter, V F T V N L, Voice for the Voiceless Newfoundland Labrador. So Councillor Lane, when we look at, uh, I think just as an interesting idea, we are looking at outreach here, right? There are so many different uh, smaller organizations that are desperate and scrambling for the same amount of donation dollars mm-hmm. and just attention from the the local citizens. How uh, how much of your day uh, is spent uh, addressing the needs of interest groups? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I, that's something that I've always been interested in. Um, one, as you know, a uh, thing that I did before I got into council kind of led me to want to run for this was an organization called Happy City. Mm-hmm. So yet another organization. But what what one of the mandates of Happy City is is to actually bring together other organizations that are representing groups of people and, and issues and advocacy and maybe if not coordinate but although that certainly comes out of it to certainly come together and see how they can collaborate and speak to issues and connect with City Hall. Mm-hmm. That was the big thing for Happy City. And so now that I'm there I do get a lot of emails and calls from organizations looking for support or just information on how they can make a difference or maybe uh, find a way to do a better job. And so really the, the main thing that I do is I'll either meet with uh, organizations to discuss how s- the city works, uh, what the funding opportunities are, if there are any. But also, it's all about connecting people. And I think if we have a strong network in our community, which we really do here in, in St. John's and in most and in all of Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, that's really what helps them grow and help them do what they need to do. And to be quite honest with you, I mean, the call-in shows of VOCM are just another example of how that word gets out. And the community really, I find, comes together. And so if the city uh, can... Just have this lane way to use a pun on my hey, that's, that's pretty yeah. good. I like that. But then maybe I can help out. <laughs> <laughs> lane way. Wow. That, I see a whole T-shirt line manifesting in front of my eyes here, Councillor. That's very interesting. Yeah, we were so, thinking for the campaign, yeah. you know, life in the fast lane, but I'm I'm kind of slow moving, so. Yeah, you're you're a deliberate individual. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd have never seen you rush, which is good <laughs> because uh, you will be one of those citizens that will not have to wear a helmet no matter where you go. <laughs> yeah, right? right on. <laughs> right. All right, we're gonna go to line number eight. We are taking a call from a uh, member of the House of Assembly, uh, Dale Kirby from St. John South. Dale, welcome back to the show. How are you? Good, thanks. And it's St. John's North, not to correct you there. <laughs> oh, well, cut my calories and call me skinny. I apologize for that. St. John's North. My mother always told me we're not too good to be told, so I... <laughs> and you know what? Maybe in 120 days from now, uh, it'll be just regular old St. John's. What do you think of that, Dale? Uh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I-, I wanted to call in and just uh, sort of report back to you on my perspective on the situation that's evolving in the House of Assembly. Uh, regarding Paul Davis's, uh, I guess, come to God moment on, uh, that we need to cut now all of a sudden 10 seats in the House of Assembly before the next election. Um, you're aware that, you know, over the last couple of years, I think it was around March 2013, there seemed to be a bit of a consensus amongst all the three parties that, uh, you know, a seat reduction was in order. And, and basically because we all felt that, uh, or at least the three party leaders felt that, um, you know, the work could get done with uh, fewer 
um, fewer members in the House. And there's some disagreement about that, uh, you know, and mostly from people who uh, aren't uh, involved directly in the affairs of the House in terms of its if sitting in there, its operations. But, uh, you know, and that's fair um, as well. But, um, I mean, we have to question why it is that this is coming now. I mean, the Tories have been in government for over 11 years. Um, this government got, uh, I guess, the, there was a, the previous Premier got a mandate in 2011, and uh, they've sort of had, uh, I guess, two and a half premiers since. Yeah, I mean, you could start a trading card deck, really, with, with the amount of premiers uh, since yeah, Danny so Williams. You wonder- you wonder like why this is coming up now, uh, you know. Well, to clarify, it now, I mean, it was supposed to be coming up in 14 months from now when it was legislated to do so. Uh, yeah. Strangely enough, uh, you know, th- there is a, a circumvention. Is I'm not sure if I'm using the word correctly, but the idea that we will uh, uh, break legislation uh, to remake another legislation does not make much sense to me. We are both breaking the idea that uh, uh, we have a fixed election date that will now seemingly be put pushed ahead for uh, a few weeks, but in order to, to push that ahead, another piece of legislation has to be broken as well, and that's the Electoral Boundaries Act. Well, from where I sit, I mean, to be honest, I mean, uh, observing what's been, what I've heard, I mean, and, you know, I, you got to sort of understand my position being in the official opposition and what I hear, you know, coming back from our leader and his meetings and then, you know, whatever information that's filtered out, it's very little uh, that comes from government to us, but, um, you know, last week when... When Paul Davis dropped this bombshell, he first said that it would be 90 days to review this. And then the next day, he changed his mind, and he said that it would actually take, I think it was less than 24 hours, and he was saying that it would take 120 days, so it would take four months to yeah. complete the work. That's more of you a know. correct statement than 90 sure. days for sure. Sure. But mm-hmm. that, he's talking about work that usually has taken up to a year to complete. And if you look at these exercises, when they've been done in a comprehensive way, in other jurisdictions in Canada, those commissions have taken anywhere from 9 to 12 months to finish those reviews. And that's not including the time that their electoral office, so here the chief electoral office in Newfoundland Labrador said that uh, that they will need four months in order to implement this. So, I mean, we're talking 9 to 12 months plus another four. That's what's more or less gone on in other jurisdictions, but uh, the Premier is now saying that this can be done in 120 days. So for me, I mean, from, from where I'm sitting, it's like they're setting us up for failure because there's no way, um, you know, and, and if they think they can, I suppose we'll give them, uh, you know, we don't really have a whole lot of a choice in the end. They have the majority, and it's pretty obvious from what went on today that they're content to sit back and ram through this legislation. All right, well, when they have an opportunity to well, do so. There, there is a bit of choice, and, it, and even if, okay, so if you're saying, before we go to the break, Dale, here's a mm-hmm. question that I'm curious about. Filibuster uh, is the word of the day, just much like gerrymandering was the word on Friday and Thursday. Mm-hmm. So if uh, both the Liberals now and the NDP are interested in the possibility of filibustering, why go through that process if, uh, at the end of the day, you're right and, and this legislation will pass without well, your support? Our leader, uh, Billy opposition. Ball, today had a press conference and set out three conditions, that are more or less the, the minimum uh, for the opposition liberals to go along with this legislation. And that would be three amendments to this, um, you know, to the bill as it has been tabled in the House of Assembly. I mean, one of them is uh, the condition is maintaining the four seats for Labrador in recognition of their, I guess, unique place in the province, their contribution to, um, you know, our, our wealth, if you will, their sort of unique geography. If you've ever been up there and done much traveling there, it's pretty difficult to, to do a significant amount of travel uh, in, by, by car. And, they, you know, even the climate is significantly different uh, than here. Um, so there's a whole bunch of differences when it comes to Labrador, and we think that we should be able to maintain the four seats there in recognition of that. We want to hold them to the 120 days that they've said that they can do this in, whether that's sort of suspend belief and go along with what they're saying if they think that that's the case. And then the other thing is to set a range uh, for uh, the commission, because as I've been, uh, you know, um, uh, discussing with people, it's... 
we don't want to be too rigid in what we set forward for the commission. We don't want to be too prescriptive in what we tell them to do in terms of the number of seats. But we do have a responsibility if we're going to uh, have an electoral boundaries commission set up to give them some parameters uh, on what we want to see in terms of the number of seats. That's so right. And let them let them set up the parameters sure. for, for the boundaries Paul themselves. Has, You're right. has been on the record in the past saying that he believed that it could be up to eight seats. What we're saying here uh, in, um, I guess, this amendment is that uh, we'll take what the Premier has been saying, the 10-seat reduction, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll take all of that into account. So what we're saying is a range uh, between 38 and 42 yeah. seats. So. Okay. Dale, we got to go to the break. I'm afraid we're about four and a half minutes over time. Uh, obviously, there's more to talk about. Maybe we can touch base later on in the week. Your press release is out there uh, for uh, amendments to, to propose reduction of electoral districts. Appreciate that. Uh, what you're doing as well as what the NDP is doing to see uh, if this process can be actually participatory. So until we next speak, uh, I'm going to wish you folks luck in the in the brand new and interesting session for the House of Assembly, but we're going to have to leave it there for the moment. Thanks for your time. Have a good show. My pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bill 42, that's not the last time we will be speaking about that tonight. Uh, join us after the break. We are here with Councillor Dave Lane from the City of St. John's. We're taking your calls, and there's some tweets we were going to address right after this. Welcome back to the show. Before we go to uh, line number two, I just wanted to touch base here with Councillor Dave Lane from the City of St. John's. We were just speaking with Dale Kirby about Bill 42, which was which is the proposed reduction by the uh, government of 10 seats within the House of Assembly. This right. is done because we're broke. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a billion dollar deficit, despite the fact that cutting 10 seats in the House of Assembly will only factor less than 0.3%, I think, of the actual deficit that we have. This is the pro, this is the start. This is the little tiny itty bitty yeah. uh, snowball which will become a giant boulder. We're looking at lots of job losses, I think, across the board. What does this, what does this do for you when you're planning? I mean, the three, you do your budgeting on a three year basis here That's in the right. city of St. John's. What can we expect, uh, uh, or how many, how many nails are being bitten right now within the, uh, within the, the city of St. John's? We're in a slightly different, uh, position than the province in that, uh, we get our revenue from uh, taxation to for property taxes gen- primarily, mm-hmm. um, and also we have a very vibrant economy that can kind of propel itself uh, to a, in a certain extent. That being said, you're absolutely right. If the province is impacted, the, the provincial government and spending changes. If they start cutting jobs, well, that's a lot of our residents, absolutely, um, and, as well as a number of companies who rely on government for for projects. They're they're contributing, they're doing work for the government, and if they don't get work. Uh, then they may have to lay off. So you'll definitely see the snowball effect. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, because we do the three-year budgeting process, this might actually be a good year for, for this to be happening, simply because we're going to spend the next year, this year, doing public consultation. And we're going to really try. We've been doing a lot of good work in expanding and enhancing the way we engage with the public at the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is going to be a real breakout year for us. So what you're going to see is instead of the last month before the budget goes out saying, you know, what do you think, everybody, we're going to start pretty soon saying, what do you think, everybody? And because everyone is really aware of what's coming with the province, with oil prices and what that could impact, I think we'll get a lot of good advice. Um, and I think it'll be very timely because then we'll say, okay, well, let's be, maybe we'll say something like let's be careful with spending or let's invest in these areas to make sure that we see growth in the right way. One thing we have been doing, we have this, uh, I, I'm very fortunate to be the, co- the, the chair of the Strategic Economic Roadmap Committee. Mm-hmm. And we have a 10-year plan at the city starting in 2011 and we're doing an evergreening process, which means we're going to make sure after three years that this plan is still working. Now, it's a great plan. We have five primary goals, and we'll go into them, but there's a lot of actions that come out of those goals, and uh, and really one of them is to make sure that we're diversifying. So the one key goal that I love, uh, where there's two, really, one is that we become an artistic metropolis, and we can talk about that you know, later on. That's an economic generator, but let's focus on our strength as a province and as a city with the offshore, and that doesn't just mean oil. We have incredible marine technology happening in this city and in this province, and if we can start really focusing on that, which we have done, that will help us get through something like this. And just a final point, really, when I look at oil, uh, yes, we have the, you know, the oil price goes up and down, and we've seen this before, but really, and it's kind of scary, we could, we actually now could 
not need oil uh, 20 years from now. And we need to really be considering that and making sure we're diversifying. If you say that in public. (laughs) (laughs) Well, listen, I'm just trying to be realistic. You know, I have a long view on this. I want to live here my entire life. I want to raise a family. I want to start a business. I need to be thinking realistically. I'm a techie. You know, I look that technology can really change the world. So I try and keep that in mind. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it publicly because I think oil is going to be around for a long time. Don't get me wrong. I think we have an incredible uh, city and province to be working in the oil industry. We have amazing talent, and we have 500 years' experience on the water in harsh environments. That's why I think that our oil industry in particular is strong, but it's young. And we also need, and anyone would need to diversify. I think we can probably ensure we keep focusing on our fishery to, to bring that back, try new ways, new modern ways of managing a fishery. Take control of our own house. I think that's what that's all about. It's making sure that we use all of our strengths, but we focus and work hard and not put all our eggs in one basket. And to be quite honest with you, I think a lot of people here that are focused on diversification and making sure we yeah, look out. I definitely agree with you, certainly with the amount of people that I've been speaking with. Diversification is on, uh, well, it's on a lot of people's radar. In fact, I know people that own a radar company, <laughs> which is interesting. They're looking into uh, radar imaging for uh, for uh, glaciers and, and really cool things yeah. like that. So it's yeah, right, right here. We, we, it's all happening right here. What also is happening right here is we got the bloody flu happening uh, right now. We're speaking with the president of the Pharmacists Association of Newfoundland and Labrador, Richard Coombs. Welcome to the show. And uh, I I didn't mean to uh, you know welcome you with a segue of talking about viruses, but it's probably brilliant uh, because there is a new antibiotics adherence program uh, rolling out today, and uh, we're hoping you could tell us a little bit about it. Sure, uh, Jonathan. Thanks. Glad to be on. My pleasure. Uh, so, yeah, the government uh, is a newly funded program uh, by the government that will seek to increase antibiotic adherence. That's the main goal of the program. It is the main goal of the program. And why is it that we need um, uh, to, to roll this out now? Uh, what is it when we look at the, the flu shot itself and antibiotics? I mean, for the past couple of years, Richard, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm sort of afraid. Maybe it's because I watch too many programs and movies about zombies, but it seems that we're developing a lot of resistance to antibiotics. So what is this program uh, and why is it being launched? Well, antibiotic resistance is it's a global problem. Um, it, it's, it's something that has to be looked at, and, and I mean, there are, there are programs all, all over the world that are, are trying to nip this in the bud now. Basically, it comes from the use, well, the misuse of, of antibiotics. Um, if you don't take them properly as prescribed, basically you kill some bugs, you leave some around, and then these bugs uh, proliferate, and then you get an increase in the bugs that they're that are not killed by the drugs. And that, so that's how it works in, in a nutshell. Okay. So proper use of antibiotics, you know, you take your, your antibiotic for the full course of treatment, you completely eradicate your infection, and if everybody did it perfectly, you know, this that's the ideal world. And that, But we're, this, so this is what we're, where we're trying to get. Why is it that we're seeing uh, such a resistance to finishing your drugs when uh, the drugs are supposed to uh, strengthen your resistance? Well... There are a number of factors at play, uh, and this is how this program is, is trying. Uh, I'll tell you how the program works. So uh, upon the dispense uh, of an antibiotic, the pharmacist will, just as they've always done, will, you know, they'll go over the, the prescription with you, um, directions for use, proper administration, uh, why it was prescribed, uh, making sure it's right for you. Uh, but the real meat of the program is the follow-ups. So there will be follow-ups with, with, with the patient. So it okay. will address uh, whether you're taking it as prescribed, um, what, and if there are any issues to adherence uh, or to taking it properly. Like, are there any reasons why you're not taking it properly? Um, are you achieving the desired benefits from it? Um, we'll try to troubleshoot any kind of adverse effects they're getting from this and reinforce the importance of continuing it for the full course of treatment. A couple of things uh, that I want to just uh, address here, Richard. It, it's, it is critical that we finish, even though we start to feel better after day three or out of day seven from taking antibiotics, you really need to stick to it, and that's the hardest lesson to convey. Uh, follow-ups, follow-ups of the pharmacist is a brilliant idea because it's so hard to see your doctor. And frankly, my own GP of, of several decades is retiring, and I'm I'm on the hunt for a new one. If you know anyone, let me know. But <laughs> but in all seriousness, uh, well, actually, I was being serious. But anyway, my point is this: I feel more comfortable talking to my doctor about my medical issues than I do with my 
pharmacist because there's a lot of people shopping for chewing gum around me when I'm talking to my pharmacist. So what sort of mechanisms uh, uh, does your association uh, provide uh, to, to help people feel more comfortable in speaking with their pharmacist? And are there areas where one can have a private conversation, for example, or is this the new normal? The vast majority of pharmacies these days have private counseling rooms in place. Oh, um, yeah, ever since the new uh, regulations recently came in t- for uh, for pharmacists' uh, vaccinations inje- by injection and inhalation, um, any pharmacy that provides that service has to have that private counseling room there. Um, I, that's probably about 10 years ago that started cropping up, and, uh, and I'd say most pharmacies you go into now, they have that private counseling room. So if, if you pick up your prescription and you're not comfortable talking about your prescription or your medical condition with your pharmacist right there at the counter, you can request, is there somewhere private, you know, that we can discuss this? And like I said, most most pharmacies can provide that. Well, that's excellent news. I'm very happy to hear that because uh, uh, sometimes it's a lot easier just to stand in line for that extra five minutes uh, while there are other people asking questions uh, oh, about sure. their own conditions than, uh, than spending uh, two weeks waiting to see your own physician. So yeah, that's sure. excellent. Richard, how do we, uh, it, how do we find out more about uh, your association? Is this an association where the public uh, should have access to, or is this purely an association that deals with, with, with your own, in other words, with, with pharmacists themselves? Is there a public aspect to the Pharmacists Association in Newfoundland Labrador? Well, we are an advocacy body, and we advocate for for pharmacists and, and for the role of the profession. Uh, but for sure, if, if the public wants any information about our, our association, just, you know, our website, panel.net, um, by all means, give us a call. Uh, our executive director, Stephen Reed, would be glad to handle any questions that the public would have. So P-A-N-L, panel.net, is uh, how uh, people can find out about you. I'll uh, put that out there. Richard, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. we got to go to the news. But uh, listen, good luck with the, the new antibiotics adherence program. I think this is a really, really smart thing to do. And uh, I, resistance is not futile, right? <laughs> no, that's right. Yeah. Get it? Thank, thanks for the opportunity, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Take care. Have, have a good night. Bye-bye. I had to get a resistance that was joke. That hilarious. Really, you. really funny. I, you're coming back. Uh, I'm inviting you back because you think I'm funny. Uh, by the way, uh, speaking of uh, uh, coming back we and, and or visiting, I guess you might say, Mayor Colin Vardy, the mayor of Wabush, is in town. He was at the House of Assembly today. He's avoiding the storm. He is avoiding the storm, uh, avoiding shoveling, and he's in our town, and we're going to speak with him right after the news. So, folks, stay with you, too. Give me a call. Welcome back to the show. Jonathan Richler here with Councillor Dave Lane, and Lucas Wall is taking your calls. So before Mayor Colin Vardy loses all power in his cell phone, <laughs> we're going to speak with him immediately. Your Worship, welcome to the show. Good day. Good evening, I should say. I managed to switch over to another phone, so it should be okay. Mazel tov. I'm very happy to hear that, uh, and yay technology. So tell me, did you come here to avoid the snowstorm? What's on the go? Yeah, no, I'm actually, uh, I'm in St. John's because, uh, we're expecting the delivery of my son any day. Hey. And, uh, I'm out here with my girlfriend. We've, we've been, well, she's been here now for about a month. We got another month to go. So, uh, uh, well, I guess we're calling part-time residents of St. John's. That's fantastic news, uh, uh, Mayor. I did not realize that, uh, you were, about to be blessed, but uh, I hope that uh, all is well and all is in order. And my goodness, it's uh, uh, is that because the town of Wabush does not have the correct facilities for for such a miraculous event? I mean, do, does everyone come here to to have their babies delivered? No, um, our new facility is very well uh, equipped, and okay. we have some, some fantastic staff. But uh, we had some complications our end, so the doctor recommended we be in the in the larger center. So here we are. Understood, and uh, I hope everything works out well. So uh, listen, you you were in the House of Assembly today. You saw how uh, they do it uh, on the provincial level. What, uh, if anything, uh, could be uh, compared to the municipal experience? I have Councillor Lane here who might be able to comment on. on this uh, fr- from the from the city's perspective. When we look at uh, sitting around a table mean, at the municipal level, there is no partisanship. It really is about the, the mission as opposed to the stripes. So, do you think that uh, municipalities are able to achieve more uh, with, well, frankly, uh, less resources than uh, the, than their their higher counterparts? One, one might ask uh, at the provincial level. What do you think, folks? Well, um, for myself, I've always been troubled with um, the way the partisan uh, politics work anyway. 
for the simple fact that I understand what my what my voice and what my vision is, and uh, you know I, I find a lot of trouble being being muzzled by the rest. Uh, uh, but as a but as, as a mayor now, I've had to learn to deal with that because uh, sometimes even on the municipal level, you know, my idea or, or my thoughts are not the one that carries when I have to deliver the message. So uh, uh, I guess I get the, a taste of it now myself. But, uh, you know, to me, that's a family today, and, you know, I, I get a taste of how the St. John's um, Council has been uh, operating, as you can watch it on TV and on the web. Um, you know, I, I sat in on uh, the Dental Labrador City's uh, council meetings, and, uh, you know, I've uh, been part of council meetings in St. John's, and I've also conducted council meetings in St. John's, and St. John's, and Wall was right. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've... Um, I've never seen the level of uh, disrespect that you see at the House of Assembly. You know, the uh, and this is this isn't talking about one side or the other. This is this is everybody in the room. You know, they're heckling, they're having a chat, they're they're walking back and forth, they're passing notes, they're talking to their neighbors, or and sometimes they're having a conversation with somebody across the floor, which is very disruptive. And there was times today um, when the premier was speaking that I couldn't even understand, I couldn't hear what he was saying. And uh, it's extremely frustrating. I, I took time in my day to come down and be part of this process, and I, have, I can't even, um, you know, I, I can't even uh, understand anything that's happening because everybody's uh, can't keep their yappers shut long enough. And uh, you know, I, I, I find it very troublesome. I know in a, in a municipal chamber, I know sometimes it gets a little bit of whack, but you know, it gets to a point where somebody has to call it in and say, "Hold on, now, one person's going to speak, and we're all going to take a turn, and we're going to be respectful to each other." And uh, I didn't see no level that today at the House of Day, which is, which is disappointing for me. I expect my, my MHA, and I'm not saying that my MHA does anything wrong today, but I expect elected officials to go in there and represent us, uh, the people, in a, in a positive and respectful way and, and not to belittle the opposition or the person who's, who's opposite to your opinion or to your idea. Yeah, Colin, it is Dave here, and I completely agree with you. I mean, really, the thing, one of the things I love about municipal government that's different from uh, provincial is it's not near as political. It is at times, but the the difference is striking. I, I think because a municipality is really down close to the people, uh, you, you, you're walking and talking with with the people that you're representing every single day. I think that almost forces you to be more respectful and thoughtful. Uh, and you know, some could even say that's why Newfoundlanders have such a great uh, attitude. And, and great hospitality is because we were small communities that were forced to really get along with each other, you know, and then you, you solve problems together. And, and, you know, when you see something like that happens in the legislature sometimes, you wonder how they get anything done. The, uh, you know, I've seen worse, uh, Mayor Vardy, I have to say, the times that I've sat in on the House of Commons, each and every time, I was more impressed that they f- continue to disappoint me. Uh, and I've seen several governments uh, uh, you know, conduct themselves in the House of Commons, and and there are little kids that come into the room to watch the proceedings. They don't care, man. And you know, they probably pick up some good uh, schoolboy or school yard tactics from uh, their members of Parliament uh, because they. Well, let me just say that the House of Assembly has nothing on what I've seen at at the uh, at the federal level. And that all goes to say, frankly, I think that uh, Councillor Lane uh, raises a very good point, which is you folks interact maybe at a more of a ground level, and therefore comport yourselves uh, differently on occasion there are times uh, that w- some of the greatest uh, fights and debates happen right here within the city of St. John's with uh, Mayor Murphy and uh, Deputy Mayor Andy Wells and then Mayor if you know what I'm talking about those were that was the golden age I think of of drama but that seems to have gone uh, by the wayside so how do we sort of transfer um, a more distinguished level of behavior uh, into our elected representatives is there is there a solution that you can think of and more importantly, Mayor Vardy and, and Councillor Lane, when you are dealing with your uh, uh, counterparts or colleagues at the at the provincial level, how do you keep a straight face? Well, you know, I, I think I think it becomes down to um, the power of the, the speaker and the House of Assembly, and uh, you know, we have to give them the support and the power uh, to to control. 
um, the, the debate. And, uh, you know, there's been times in uh, my own chambers where we've got into a bit of heated debate and, you know, I've had to say, okay, now everybody be quiet and we're going to listen to, you know, what Councillor Burke wants to say and what Councillor Dillon wants to say and we're going to go around the table. And people, uh, you know, some points that you're cheating us like children. I'm not cheating like children. It's my responsibility to make sure that everybody has, has a, uh, um, a, 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 an opportunity, a fair debate. So, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the the Speaker in the House of Assembly should, uh, you know, I have to become more strict, and, and I support it, and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know how else to deal with it, except for, uh, you know, when when the Speaker has to be on his feet for uh, uh, for 80% of the uh, uh, the sitting, um, you know, I think they'll get the idea and they'll start behaving a little better. Here's a good uh, point. Wally Lehman's ra- raising on Twitter. Dave, uh, you take this one first and then call in if you don't mind. Wally Lehman says, I think MHA should not be allowed to have cell phones in the House of Assembly because how often is an MHA tweeting while another MHA is uh, it's going to continue? But I'm guessing he's going to either say talking about a certain issue or tweeting back to them. Do you folks allow this type of communication levels within your own council? Uh, Councillor Lane? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. We all have uh, iPads, uh, and I do all of my email on my iPad. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't have a computer for my council work. Okay. I'm a, I'm a techie. Uh, but all of us have iPads. Um, and I'm actually guilty today of tweeting <laughs> during the council meeting. <laughs> Sometimes I think um, when there's a debate on the floor, it is helpful to be able to connect with what people are responding to because, you know, there are two or three groups might be tweeting out what's happening. So in that case, I think to be connected during the meeting is good, but you have to be respectful and you have to listen. You know, like I say, I, I was guilty of it and to be honest, with you it was an issue that I wasn't focused on and uh, I, I kind of zoned out for a bit and I felt bad about it afterwards. So I try not to. Whether you can set a rule for that, I'm not sure because sometimes you, you do need to be connecting and getting work done while you're in the legislature, I guess, in this case. And in my case, it would be in the council chamber. Okay. Uh, Mayor Vardy, what do you think? Um, we actually have a policy where uh, we understand that our, our, some of our councillors and people involved with council have uh, commitments that requires them to carry a cell phone, and that's fine. Um, but we ask them if they're only answered over a cell phone or, or to respond to any text message that they, they excuse themselves and then do it that way. And, you know, I, I guess it comes down to whatever works for each council. I'm not saying that the way that, that our council does it is, is the best way, but it works for us, and uh, that's the way we'll continue to do so. Fair enough. Thank you. I appreciate your candor. Uh, Councillor Han uh, today in, in uh, at the city council meeting uh, was uh, uh, mentioning uh, in some form a regional government or cooperation. And, you know, the word amalgamation was bandied about, but I don't think it was in that context. I believe the idea uh, was to discuss uh, a cooperation amongst all regional governments. And I know that this was a topic uh, brought up uh, during municipalities, Newfoundland Labrador, about two months ago. Uh, maybe uh, both of you could, now that, I, now that I'm amalgamating uh, a conversation with three people, huh, um, what do you think about the future of this province with respect to our municipalities? We have so many municipalities here in this province. Do we have too many? You know, my my first um, my first take on it is the I'm not sure we have too many municipalities. I actually believe that we have too many uh, uh, service districts that are not service districts, or they're they're kind of off the grid. And uh, I think we need to get a handle on that first. Are you referring um, to the unincorporated ones? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we we have you know as a as a small community of, of Wabush, you know, there's there's other communities that are similar in size or or similar in. Uh, um, in uh, economic busyness, I guess you call it, or economic uh, choice, that um, um, that are not incorporated, and you know they they still have managed to have their um, their pavement on the on their highways and their street lights and manholes, and uh, I don't know where it's all coming from, but but they're a municipal council or a, or, a, or a service district. It's, it's amazing to see how the hell this is happening. So you know, I think um, you know, municipalities. Uh, this new fiscal framework is important that MNL is putting forward and work the government with. I think that's uh, extremely important. And uh, but I think one of the first steps that uh, the government has to get is grasp on how they deal with these unincorporated municipalities. All right, Councillor, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, just briefly. I think in the case of St. John's and the Avalon region, uh, we're in a unique situation. I mean, like we have almost half, certainly a third of the population in one tiny little area. 
all of our streams run together. You mm-hmm. know, we share a lot of workers go back and forth between the communities. So we have a lot of shared uh, interests. So I think uh, really uh, what we need to do is focus on how can we continue to coordinate. That's the word that I like to use, to be honest with you. I'm a huge proponent of cooperation. And uh, and just, I guess the point, that the concern with amalgamation, if, if we're going to talk about that again, uh, is that what can happen is that little neighborhoods and communities can lose a sense of identity of where you are from. Sure. We have some communities in, in, in our city that have retained that against the odds. We're talking about like Goulds, Kilbride, uh, Georgetown, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But it can be lost, uh, a sense of uniqueness, and also just an autonomy to respond directly to issues that are happening in your neighborhood. When you walk out and you know your neighbors, you feel safer, your kids get to know each other, you have a school there. And really what it comes down to for us is how do you plan your neighborhoods, which is another huge issue. That is a huge issue. Counselor and uh, your worship, we're going to have to leave it there. we got to go to the break at the uh, at the 20-minute uh, mark. Uh, listen, um, I want you to keep me apprised of your uh, situation there, Mayor Vardy, when you, are, when you are increasing your family by plus one, because I want to congratulate you for contributing to the population growth strategy. <laughs> so please let me know uh, uh, if everything goes all right, uh, and uh, let me know how I can help. Bill Van Colstadt. Fantastic. Enjoy your stay here, and uh, just be happy you don't have to shovel tonight. Thank you much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, folks, we are going to go to the break afterwards. We are speaking with Josh Taylor about some municipal issues, and if I know Mr. Taylor, probably a couple of surprises as well. Stay with you, too. Give me a call. Welcome back to the show. If you are interested in all things municipal, we are sitting here with uh, Councillor Dave Lane from the City of St. John's. We had uh, Colin Vardy, uh, the mayor of Wabush, on the phone as well. And, uh, interesting, Mike Lockman, aka Lockdown, uh, uh, who is here in the VOCM newsroom, he says that Colin Vardy is stating, to use my own words, that some MHA should give their heads a shake. That's very interesting. Now, someone who knows a bit, bit about, uh, heads, uh, is an intellectual, uh, around town, one might say, Mr. Josh Taylor. Welcome to the show. How are you tonight? Oh, great intro, Jonathan. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm working, I'm working on, uh, my wordsmithing tonight and thank you for the inspiration. Josh, what's on your mind? I know you have a few, um, shall we say pet projects when it comes to municipal issues. Uh, what would you like to talk about? Oh, yeah. Um, well, uh, first off, I just want to take on from a point Dave just made, which I thought was, it was excellent, was about, uh, how at a municipal level you can get things done. Like we often think of our government in terms of three levels federal, provincial, municipal, and almost seems by, as we go down the chain, you almost in some ways feel it's it's lesser. But uh, I think the beautiful uh, part about municipal politics and and, uh, its operation is that real things change and you actually get things done. I mean, how many times have we seen a provincial or federal government spend a fortune on some consulting report to go on a shelf and, and it never tangibly affects people, whereas you build a park, you do the loop, you put in a transit station, you open a farmer's market, and people immediately see the benefit. That's a very good point. Uh, it, it's almost a uh, it's almost a quick grab, wouldn't you say? I I, I definitely say that. But actually, the uh, building from that, taking on from the theme of municipalities getting things done, I wanted to. I've, I've been reflecting on this uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but the concept of downloading um, certain things, specifically infrastructure investments, to municipalities, and I don't know if it plays maybe so well in uh, St. John's area because there's a large municipalities and they require large organizations to run the municipality. But certainly in the rural areas of Newfoundland, I think there's a huge opportunity to be to be gained with downloading some infrastructure investment, at least for project management aspect of it, to uh, municipalities. And if, if you'll allow me, I'd like to tell you a story. Go for it. Okay, well, um, on the northeast coast, um, I'm quite uh, fond up there. You know, I do a fair bit of uh, sealing and fishing up there. But on the northeast um, coast, there are some excellent stories about um, very hardworking uh, municipalities who do a lot of, um, I would say, a lot of grunt work, a lot of uh, scrounging, I would call it, to, to keep their municipality running with very limited budgets. And uh, an, an example comes to mind. I won't tell you the people or the or the uh, the exact town because I don't I don't know if I got the facts exactly right. But the concept was they had a problem with the water supply. Uh, they had a leaky dam, and of course went to the provincial government, who were incredibly helpful, responded quickly, and said we can work with you to fix that. Came in, sized it up, and just to get their equipment in, they'd have to put in a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar road, and uh, total cost was about a half a million dollars. Well. Most municipalities or most people might just roll over and say, well, that's what it's going to cost. The provincial government will have to do it. 
But these people are, uh, you know, the type of people that $450,000, whether it's their money or someone else's money, they don't like to see it wasted. Anyway, they go together, they put together a plan, and uh, four local tradesmen with about six, $6,000 in material were able to fix that, um, to fix that dam. You know, so right there... Was any bond, was any bond released? Uh, any bond? <laughs> no bonds were released. No one got the lumber contract. It was just six thousand uh, dollars in material. <laughs> Great comment, though. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> no, I know. And you know, uh, in that same community, you can go down uh, the road and you can see uh, a government wharf, a uh, small wharf, is built on a make work project, and um, it's gone to you know it's derelict now after ten years. Meanwhile, their stages they're fifty and sixty years in perfect condition because people own them. So my comment, I'll throw it back to you guys, is uh, if there an opportunity, I mean, I, I think that uh, municipal, um, at the municipal level, maybe we can look at applying infrastructure a little bit better, rather, and, you know, n- and avoid that over-designing that so, hop- that so often happens when, uh, when the provincial government gets involved in small community projects. What do you think? Sometimes the tender process is your greatest enemy. You're always looking for the cheapest dollar. The pro- I'm going to throw this to Councillor Lane. When you're looking at uh, downloading responsibilities onto municipalities, the biggest problem is municipalities don't have the same budget as government. So how can you download a responsibility uh, when they can only afford uh, someone at one quarter of the price? Councillor Lane, am I just making this up or am I accurate? No, sir, I think it's a good point. Uh, well, the first point I'll make is that, so I've been on council just over a year, and the mm-hmm. tendering process has become, I've, I've now learned what it is and the, the cheapest uh, price by law you have to take. Right. Uh, I guess the one thing that I'm hoping we can do uh, is if we can't change that rule, I understand why it's there. Uh, if we can say, well, let's be more specific with our requirements so that we get, because what happens is that you might get a project, uh, it's the cheapest, but you might get a piece of gear that uh, you can't replace the parts in. Because it was it happened to be the cheapest at the time, but it's from Bulgaria, mm-hmm. you know. But if you had just got the guys from Cat to give you the machine, and they, you know, maybe they cost a hundred thousand dollars more, uh, but now they'll lend you one while you're fixing the other one. Yeah, you know, it just can't happen. So anyway, that, that's just one point. I guess in terms of downloading services, I am a proponent of it. You have to be careful, obviously, for the the reason you state. If you don't have the funding or the expertise, that might be a mistake. But I guess to Josh's point is, if we partner well and collaborate and just say, well, how, how can we do this the best? It's like, well, we've got six guys here could easily patch this up and it would save us, you know, f- half a million dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's a huge win for everybody. And I think if we could collaborate a bit more and, and coordinate on these sort of things better now, and then this comes back to the regionalization thing because then what we would have in, in the sense of, uh, you know, the Northeast Avalon is you've got, you know, seven or eight municipalities who have resources who can then work together and, you know, then the government, the provincial government wouldn't have to be regulating as much on us. We would be in charge of our own destiny in, in that sense. But for smaller communities, you know, and municipalities in L, uh, do a lot of work to help with that sort of thing. They're, they're a bit of a third party. It's an association of the municipalities, but they aren't, they aren't government and they can help make those, uh, connect those, uh, the province to municipalities in, in a more constructive way. It's a real challenge, uh, and you know, sometimes the power does not want to be uh, released either from, from the top level. Josh, are you so certain yeah. that, uh, that this would be uh, uh, as easy as you're, pro- as you're proposing? Uh, I don't think it's, it, it's necessarily easy, but I mean, we're, the only reason that we don't allow um, people at municipal levels, or maybe we, we're not structured to make sure that that money flows to municipal, municipal levels, is kind of a, almost like a patronizing argument that, oh, a small town councillor in, in Burgio or in Wabush or in the northeast, northern peninsula, doesn't have the expertise or the or the experience, you know the experience to deliver it, but in actual fact, there are cases where they might not have the engineering department that uh, that the provincial government has. But in a lot of cases, the local knowledge there more than makes up for it. I mean, you get people that are in the provincial government that are doing things on municipal levels, and they've never been there, and they have no clue what's to be done. Now, I'm not saying download everything to to municipal uh, governments. What I'm definitely saying is there's there's something to be looked at, and and something that I've, I've been a big advocate on. I've talked to you with many times, uh, Jonathan, is about uh, getting closer to our food supply, bringing the food fishery uh, more into focus. Something I would like to see is the development of a wharf culture and a farmer's market throughout Newfoundland. And there's no better way uh, to do that than to roll it out with municipalities building it and uh, building it in their, like, not us coming down from a provincial government and, and putting, a, you know, a mall equivalent in every single small community. That's not the way to do it. And I, I just think to encourage that grassroots infrastructure, I see a huge opportunity to use that local knowledge. So, yeah, I don't think it's, it's, it's a perfect 
um, scenario where every, it works for everything. But I think it's something we can look at. And the federal government, uh, when they downloaded and balanced the budget back in the, under the Liberals in early 2000s, they did it by downloading a lot of stuff to provincial governments. And a lot of the deficits uh, ballooned at the provincial level. But when you actually added it up on aggregate, it, it wasn't as much money in deficit that moved from federal to provincial. And the reason is because provinces know their province better than the federal government does, just like municipalities will know their town better than the than the provincial government would. And I think that's, sometimes, that's, mm-hmm. yeah. That's a regional yeah. zing. You got it. Sometimes what? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Josh. Oh uh, no, I was just saying that sometimes I would say our decision making is a little too town focused. Now to, sh- to shift back to town where I do live, where I'm not from, I'd say my my, my body resides, maybe my heart's outside. But um, I'd, I'd like to tackle the issue of transit if I've got the time. Uh, well, we're going to run to to another uh, call, I think, after uh, Councillor Lane comments on this. But Josh, hold the issue of transit because yep. I really want to make a show all about that, and I think uh, that's brilliant. So I I hate to uh, to stifle that idea for the moment, but uh, timing is an issue, and I appreciate your patience on this. So Councillor Lane, do you want to uh, comment on what Josh? Sure. Well, I mean, just r- one real quick point to extend on what Josh is saying is that we can even go further grassroots, and one of the things that's going to help us to to enable municipalities to do what they're capable of Mm -hmm. is to use, well, for lack of a better term, technology. I mean, really what we have is now what, if we can, uh, we can have databases and then interfaces that allow residents to get access to the information they need and the resources they need online, uh, that is what can actually help a municipality do what they're thinking, but it also helps residents to take control over city services. Uh, in the city of St. John's, we have the 311 call center, but we also have, you know, a mobile app that allows you to report things to find out when your garbage is going to be picked up, mm-hmm. you know, things that really give you a bit more control and autonomy over your own life. And we can apply that to municipalities across the board, and it's happening all over the world. It's it's, it's a trend that we can't avoid, and it I think it's really exciting. I think so, too. One thing I want to comment, uh, Josh, before we go, and thank you for your time time and we'll talk transit real soon here it is there are some some things that one cannot uh, download uh, but even if there is some responsibilities that uh, municipalities can take on you you talked about the idea of uh, farmers markets for example one thing i would not like to see is the food safety issue be uh, uh, reinvented uh, in a re- on a regional basis there are some aspects of of governance uh, that come from a larger level w- which are i think vital and essential to help uh, municipalities Municipalities foster even a microeconomic climate such as the farmers market, but really everybody still has to follow the same rules because nobody likes botulism. Absolutely, you, you link it all together mm-hmm. and you implement it locally. You you think globally and you act locally. Got it, Josh Taylor. Thanks for uh, calling in tonight. Uh, much appreciated, and we'll uh, we'll get you on again when we uh, discuss uh, moving parts. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Great concept here tonight. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Good thanks, night, Josh. sir. Take care now. Bye bye. All right, we're going to take one more call, I think, before the break. But uh, Chris Mitchell Moore is weighing in. Um, of course, he is an MHA of a small, small area, rural area, I should say. Not a small area, but definitely a rural area. He says small towns of just a few hundred people in the past needed 25%. Only a few years ago, they'd certainly find the most affordable option. I asked for a little bit of clarification. He's saying, uh, you know, most would find the most affordable option because they have limited budgets. And even a 10% contribution, they will want to find the lowest cost option. And that's called fiscal responsibility. And, you know, these are some very good points. I appreciate that, Chris. Thanks for weighing in. He says uh, also that there are restrictions that require tender for projects of certain value. Uh, Chris, maybe we can touch on that in the future, one of our future segments, because I think the tendering process is something that we need to uh, investigate. Uh, uncover, if you will, but not in a Geraldo way, but you know, in a real way. So we're going to go right now to Corner Brook. Uh, we're speaking with uh, Melissa Martin. Uh, last week uh, we spoke with uh, Melissa uh, because she is a certified mental health counselor. But uh, Melissa, you are also an author. Welcome to the show. Tell us about this interesting book. And uh, Colin Vardy, if you're still listening, you might find this interesting. Melissa, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. You know, I do have to refer back to what you were talking about with food and tweeting with municipality. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with you tweeting me during our conversation. (laughs) As long as it's good food pictures of that brisket that I know you make. (laughs) Thank you, but I'm not an elected official, so, you know, I can tweet that. I can tweet. Yeah, I can go to Vegas as far as I'm concerned, as long as I got a good radio connection. Hey, yeah, I don't know. (laughs) But thank you. you. That's very kind of you. Melissa, you have a book out, uh, which, which is supposed to, uh, and I think uh, is interesting. I'm looking forward to reading it. It's going to bridge the gap between pregnancy 
pregnancy and mental health when a mom is having, I guess, a second baby. So tell us uh, a little bit about uh, Belly Check. Well, it is a month-by-month pregnancy guide activity book and keepsake for the soon-to-be big brother and big sister. And the premise behind it was to help alleviate jealousy and resentment between siblings. Um, It does not have to be an automatic response to bringing a new baby home. Um, And it has to do with how we divide our attentions as parents. So when I was pregnant with my first child, there were no books out in the market for kids to follow along like parents can. So I wrote one. How challenging was it to write a book while, uh, you know, uh, wrestling with uh, a growing entity within yourself? I mean, I have no idea. Neither Counselor Lane nor myself can really comment on what it's like to, you know, be an an expectant mother, first and foremost. But B... uh, Every uh, pregnant woman that I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, always sometimes excuses themselves because they have these moments where uh, their own body uh, releases hormones, if you will, to, to confuse the, them, and they sometimes have a hard time focusing. Uh, what, did you find writing a book uh, beneficial, or was it challenging in that aspect? No, you know, I started writing it uh, when I was, oh gosh, when I was pregnant. And finished it shortly after, but my pregnancy, I've had three pregnancies and they were all like the best, the best times. I absolutely loved being pregnant. Good for you. And thank you for contributing to the population growth strategy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I, 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 we created three great human beings, so I'm very proud of all three of them. Wonderful. Well, uh, I, uh, I'm a baby of uh, five kids, so I, I don't know what it's like to, uh, to have uh, an, an aspect or an issue of jealousy towards uh, the next one coming. But I've heard great stories of, uh, you know, when the new child is introduced to a big brother or a big sister, they just wail and cry. And you know, are looking for the nearest thing to throw, uh, or or you know, just to just get out of the room because they don't want to deal with the fact that they are now uh, second best or third best, etc. What's it like, and what sort of uh, tips are you giving uh, to the child, and how do you how do you make it accessible for both the parent and the kid? Well, I think it can be that way. I don't think it has to be. And you know, I used a lot of the. Things, um, you know, a lot of the things that I use in the book, I applied to my own my own kids. And, you know, when my second son was born, um, the attachment that he had to his big brother and his his big brother to him was just absolutely beautiful. Nobody could make the baby smile like the big brother. It was Mm. just absolutely beautiful. But I think you have to find a balance between including you have to include the older sibling and let them know it's not all about the baby, but at the same time, how important they are to their new baby brother or sister that's being born. It doesn't. It goes beyond the shirt that says big brother, in other words, <laughs> right? It, or big it sister. Goes, yeah, it goes beyond, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this book is being published uh, by yourself, uh, or do you have uh, a publisher locally? I published it myself. I consider myself one of the cool kids. Um, indie publishing and self-publishing for a long time was seen as vanity publishing, mm-hmm. but that has evolved so much over the years. Um, Beatrix Potter's uh, uh, Peter Rabbit was originally self-published. There, was a, there were a lot of really successful wow. self-published books. At the same time, it's a huge challenge because everything about the publishing process and the creative process you're basically doing yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's been a huge learning curve and really um, using a lot of different resources. It's been a labor of love, no pun intended, but (laughs) there it is. Well, I hope the labor wasn't nine months. That would be... (laughs) 15 15 years. It took 15 15 years years. to create it. Wow. 15 years. Well... I'm not an illustrator, and children's books have to be illustrated. This isn't your typical children's picture book. It's 74 pages separated into nine uh, chapters, obvious chapters. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, can't draw, can't paint, can't... I can color in between the lines. That's about the best I do. And I've got three, and my kids are artists, but I'm not. Um, So it's been really difficult to make it come to life by myself. And it took 15 years and the Internet and technology catching up to make it happen. I used uh, illustrations and artists from the U.S. to Germany, Um, just the timing and finding things online and finding artists. And um, it just all came together perfectly. 
So I waited for technology to catch up to what I needed. It's interesting, you know, with the with the advent of word processing, we've seen uh, it, an onslaught of of people uh, cracking uh the code to writing their own stories and that's how we get the uh, the Harry Potters of the world uh, manifest is uh, through you know the ease of technology i mean councilor lane here is t- telling us how he's a techie and how all municipal uh, affairs are done seemingly uh, with with ipads etc there's not a lot of written words out there but you're you're doing both you're using technology to create the written words so congratulations yeah, Thank you, and it's a beautiful process because there's so many talented people out there, creative with, uh, you know, so much to contribute. And 10, 15 years ago, you know, access to simple programs like Photoshop weren't accessible to just anybody. You had to go into uh, a graphic design uh, place and have somebody actually do it for you. And now with the accessibility to all that technology, there's just some amazing things being created. Just amazing. Congratulations. So, Melissa, if uh, anyone's interested in getting their hands on this book, is it available locally? It's available through me, uh, through my website, bellycheck.ca, and you can also purchase it on Amazon.com and Amazon.ca. Excellent. Good luck with it. And, uh, Melissa, I think that you and I will, will speak in the future uh, because Thanks. I'll probably continue to tease you with uh, photos of, of the brisket over the old Twitter. I'm going to so have to take I apologize a trip over. In advance. <laughs> All right. <laughs> take care in Cornerbrook tonight, and we'll speak in the future. Thanks for joining Thanks us. So take much. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're going to go to uh, to the last break of the evening. Councillor Lane, I can't believe it. It's uh, These hours fly by. It's such a joy. It really is. There you go. And speaking of joy, uh, our next guest is uh, the Honorable Keith Hutchings, Minister of Municipal and Intergovernmental Affairs. I'm sure he's going to tell us that there were some joyous moments in Ottawa, but by the sounds of it, not a lot. So stay where you too. Minister Hutchings, up next. Welcome back to the show. A lot of people love to go to Ottawa to check out the food and, uh, you know, look at that farm of uh, feral cats that's behind Parliament Hill. But uh, some people go to Ottawa on a mission. We're joined right now with Minister Keith Hutchings, who, of course, is our Minister of Municipal and Intergovernmental, men, govern, Intergovernmental Affairs. Wow, stumbly. Uh, and, uh, Minister, you did go to Ottawa recently with, uh, with Minister Darren King, who is the Minister of Business, Tourism, Cultural, and Rural Development. You went to speak to a number of people about uh, one particular issue. So welcome to the show. Greatly appreciate that you could join us tonight. What happened up there and uh, what is the, tell us a little bit about uh, the line in the sand drawn by the government today uh, with respect to CETA and all bilateral uh, negotiations and trade agreements. Uh, thanks, Janet. Thanks for the opportunity. Pleasure. Um, yeah, Minister King and I uh, traveled to Ottawa last Tuesday and had a couple of days of meetings with uh, several ambassadors, uh, officials from Spain. We went with the, uh, the UK, uh, Germany, Denmark, uh, and as well met with some industry groups, the uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce, the Canadian Executive, uh, Canadian Council of Executives, and also the Beef and Pork uh, Industry, uh, National Industry Group. And our efforts there, Jonathan, was just uh, articulating, I guess, the province position, uh, the seat of negotiations and where we're to. Uh, certainly to make them aware from an embassy perspective that you know we're at a point now where um, the agreement we had, I guess, uh, met with the federal government mm-hmm. uh, is not being reached from what we know and what we can tell. They're not going to honor the commitment. So we had to advise them that if that's not uh, honored, um, from our perspective, we couldn't uh, be part of the seat agreement, uh, certainly from the point of view of areas of provincial jurisdiction, uh, which the EU wanted uh, Canadian provinces and territories involved with this agreement. So provincial areas of provincial jurisdictions that the agreement would cover would be resolved and there would certainly be no difficulty with it. Uh, in regards to the industry groups you met with, them, they're very uh, concerned about the fact that you may have uh, someone in Canada, a province, uh, not on side with this, and they certainly don't want to see the agreement uh, not go through, nor do us. And, I mean, that's a very important point. I mean, we see the value of CETA and trade, and obviously you look at the commodities we have, Jonathan, in our province, I mean, we've been exporters for quite a while, and it's, you know, what we do. So we're very pro-trade, but the issue we have is that we negotiated a complex uh, set of circumstances and advantages for the province and some concessions in the whole CETA uh, agreement in our bilateral discussions with Canada. And at at the last minute, I guess, we were told that they had changed, particularly to, as it relates to the, uh, the industry renewal fund that we created and how that would flow. So, and today, that fund is that fund the the four hundred million dollar uh, fund that's shared between uh, our government and and the federal government. 
Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. it'd be 280 by the feds and 120 by us, right? All right. So that was fundamental to us because with that in parallel, and obviously I'm just going to talk about the fishery here, but the, our understanding in terms of what we agreed to was multifaceted in terms of the agreement. It included other professional services and other things too. But with this fund and everybody agrees in the industry that you need a transition and we need to get to a place in our industry that we can really grow it and take advantage of the European market, this huge market. And this would help in parallel, certainly, with the reduction in the significant tariffs that now exist up to 20%. Bringing those down, and as well as having this fund, would certainly allow us to take, I think, an industry thought, too, to take the leap to get us to where we need to be and transition our industry. And that really was what the agreement was all about. So just today, I mean, we've been at this for about 10 months now. I think in January 2014, uh, Rob Moore came down with a co officials as the federal government has decided that the a co would be the operational arm of this fund, and we designated DFA. So we had a very good meeting in January 2014. Uh, we talked about the five pillars that the province had established. Everybody was in agreement with that. And then it became an issue of how we would operationalize the fund because when the agreement was signed, the, the terms were that the money would flow then. So we wanted to get all this in place before we got to when the money flowed. Sure, and yeah, so the agreement was signed. Uh, well, when the agreement was signed, the money would flow, but no agreement was actually signed as to when, the, the, I mean, as to the flow of money. In other words, that was the issue, was it not? That uh, w it, this was uh, far from a, uh, a signed deal in the first place. That being said, uh, Minister Hutchings, and I don't want to debate uh, whether or not there was, because this has been discussed on, on many levels. Here's my question that, that shakes me to the bone. Are we prepared as a provincial government uh, to withdraw our participation in all trade agreements and uh, uh, trade agreements currently under negotiation uh, on a bilateral level when we are busted broke? Is this the time to to do to make such a move for over you know just over two hundred and eighty million dollars? I don't I don't get it. Maybe you can tell me, and I'm completely ignorant uh, about this. So please, uh, I'm looking for some answers here. How much are our other bilateral agreements worth that we're putting it all? on the line for $280 million? Well, I think we're putting it on the line. We're putting it on the line is our role in uh, the Federation in regards to our bilateral discussion with the federal government. So, for, you know, if this agreement here, the trade agreement, we need to negotiate it, and we agree it, and, you know, you can go across the country, there's the National Post, uh, there's been the current university academics, others have reviewed this and said, yes, this is a principle of a deal, and you have a deal, Newfoundland and Labrador. Mm -hmm. But if we have this trade deal, and we negotiate it a way forward, and it's not been honored, so what's the point of, of negotiating further deals if we don't have the faith that what we negotiated at the end of the day is going to represent what we thought we had? I mean, this fundamental principle here is that once you negotiate these elements of agreement, they had to be adhered to. And that's where we're to today. And all we're saying to the federal government, come to the table, let's opera, operational this fund and the guidelines that we agreed to, and let's move it forward. Trade is extremely important. Sure, it is extremely important, and you know what? I, I agree in principle that when things are negotiated or signed, they should be adhered to. For example, a fixed election date, but sometimes uh, there are movements within and without, and maybe we can negotiate for $200 million as opposed to $280 million. I don't know. I'd like to see it be $500 million as opposed to two hundred eighty from from Ottawa, but at the end of the day, uh, what are we putting on the line when you say that we are withdrawing uh, our support or participation in all trade agreements? Can you tell me, Minister, Please. how many bilateral trade agreements are we currently in uh, into with uh, with the federal government well there's the asian pacific uh, partnership that's underway now there's um, internal trade that's been reviewed uh, there's a third one um, what is case me i think it's related to japan mm -hmm. so three of these are underway in various stages of discussion okay we're, we're saying we're suspending the talks with them until we deal with this issue with CETA. All right, so those are the ones that are in, in, in discussion, shall we say. Which bilateral agreements uh, are in existence and have been in existence for a number of years, months, etc.? What is on the line here? Well, they're all continuing on. We're not interfering with those. We're talking about ones that are in current in negotiations. Oh, because it says here in the press release, suspending its participation in all trade agreements and all trade agreements currently under negotiations. Am I misreading that? Well, from my perspective, it's trade agreements that are done and, and that, are, that are law now and are in international trade. They're not, we're not talking about those. Oh, we're that's a relief. Ones, we're talking about ones that are underway right now. And that's Pardon what we're me. saying. We're suspending uh, discussion on those that we deal with the CETA agreement. Mm -hmm. Because to your point, why would you do this? So my point is we're negotiating trade agreements. And you're negotiating trade agreements and 
you know, there's principles that aren't being adhered to in the first one. How do you skip over that and then go to the second and third and negotiate those? Excellent point. Uh, and, you know, the salient question. I don't know the answer to that. My, my next question is, beyond... The, the, the belly laugh that we all had here in the province when, when we truly revealed the intelligence of Peter McKay uh, in last week's uh, quotation from one of our ministers. What do we do uh, when he says, throws it back in our face and says that uh, this is not a slush fund? I mean, how do we deal with, with someone who, who uses that type of, I hate to say it, you know, bully tactics? Uh, you know, how can we negotiate or, or even have faith in any negotiations when a government uh, uh, treats us like idiots? Well, that's the issue. I mean, this not, you know, they've called it an insurance policy, they've called it a blank check, they called it, an, an, uh, as you said, a slush fund. Yep. I mean, it's been changing for months. And if you go back and look and what the original uh, description was of the fund, and they designated a COA. COA is about development, it's about looking forward, it's about innovation. So that's where our mindset was when we came up with this fund. And it would be administered. It wouldn't be a black check. It would be application-based. It would be based on five pillars, research. And it would be paid out based on applications and based out uh, based on requests. So it wouldn't be a blank check and it wouldn't be a slush fund. That's really offensive. And I'd rather not go there, but, I mean, if we're going to solve this, I mean, we need to reflect on what the facts are and move forward collectively to get this resolved for the better of everybody. I really hope that uh, this is the bottom line. You know, uh, when we look at... Uh, turning our backs on Ottawa. Historically, in the past, there may be a short-term gain. I think those days are over. We are not dealing with a weak prime minister uh, as uh, Danny Williams was uh, over 10 years ago. Uh, it, you know, he may or may not be on his way out, but the current prime minister holds a lot more uh, political clout and uh, maneuverability than Paul Martin. So to withdraw or suspend participation is uh, this is a symbol and a specter of the past. And and I don't think that uh, you, as a government, arrived at it uh, lightly. Uh, I would love to have been a fly on the wall when this was discussed. But um, <clears throat> can and I you, guess, can, yeah, just John, just the other point too. Just, sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. I mean, we've been up front. We've released all our documentation. Uh, I and other ministers were involved. Have been out answering questions. I mean, Minister Fast came to our province in May of 2013. Mm-hmm. And basically at that time said to us, uh, you know, we have an issue here in regards to MPRs in the EU. Are you willing to move? We consulted with industry. And when we balanced it all out, we said this is something that at the end of the day, the advantages would be far greater than holding them just for the EU, because that's all we're giving them up to, just the EU. It's not anybody else. And so they entertained and came to us and asked us to consider this. And that's the thing that's a little galling. And to this point, um, you know, there may be a couple of tweets from Minister Fast's office today but we haven't heard from him. No one in the public has heard from him. He hasn't answered to the province request to meet with him. We were in Ottawa for three days. Maybe he's in a bunker at Peter Fernashua. Maybe. I don't know. But anyway, you know, that, and, and if you were to analyze the deal and say, okay, which side here is out front and is laying out the information and say, question us, let us know, uh, we've done that. But on the other side, we haven't seen it. So to me, that's telling. I uh, yeah, I, I, you're right. Sometimes uh, the the evidence uh, is revealed in silence. Uh, Minister Hutchings, you've had the last word tonight. I appreciate it, and uh, I hope this is resolved quickly. Just to clarify one more time, the participation is being suspended in trade agreements currently under negotiation. Not all trade agreements bilaterally between Ottawa and the province. That's right. The ones that are in action are in action today. We're talking about ones that are currently under discussions and. Uh, those three or four that I mentioned. Okay. Uh, the press release uh, that came out from uh, from the Department of Municipal and Governmental Affairs, I I misunderstood it. I don't know if you might want to uh, look at it, but maybe um, just reading it incorrectly. But uh, I, the way it's written, it looks to be that uh, it is one and two. But if you're telling me it is just one, uh, that uh, I can breathe a sigh of relief because that is a lot of money if we had both on the line. I greatly appreciate your time tonight, sir, as always. Uh, quite scintillating, but we're a little over time, so I'm going to have to wish you a very good evening. Thanks, Shannon. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Well, this has been a lot of fun. We're going to do it again, Municipal Mondays with Councillor Dave Lane and uh, a few guest uh, councillors along the way. I hope you had fun. I had a great time, Jonathan. Thanks so much for having me on. That's a real pleasure. So you can reach us uh, at, uh, well, follow along at uh, VOCM Nylon and at Dave Lane Tweets, right? That's the one. Are there any underscores in there, Dave? Nothing. No? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Lucas Wall, for producing the Dickens out of the show. We are out of time, so until... Tomorrow night, you have Patty uh, in the morning and Pete in the afternoon to keep you going. And until then, Lila Tuff.